I'm Colin Blakemore. I'm professor of neuroscience and philosophy at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. And I'm going to talk about the perception of visual space. Uh, people who study vision are normally interested in how we see objects, things, other people, faces, and so on. But I'm going to be talking about how we see nothing, how we see the space in between. Uh, and in particular, how we understand the third dimension of space, so important for, for any animal, whether you're a predator or a prey. You need to know how far away things are. I'm going to talk about the mechanisms in the brain that tell us something about how far away things are. Uh, that's partly to do with the fact we've got two eyes, so we can use our eyes like simultaneous um, uh, range finders, if you like, um, binocular vision, stereoscopic vision, 3D vision. Um, but we also learn a lot just from the information that's in the image, particularly from perspective. And artists, of course, when they discovered that, went crazy about it because it allowed them to create pictures on a flat surface that looked as if they were three-dimensional. So I'm going to talk about the interplay, really, between the discoveries of artists and the techniques that they use. Architects as well, because they make solid buildings that fill space, wanting them to look nice to us with our imperfect mechanisms for understanding space. So I'm going to talk about the interplay between science and art and architecture. So good evening and welcome to the final Darwin College lecture series this year. Uh, this year this, our lecturers have covered a wide range of aspects of vision, the theme. We've gone from hallucinations to our vision and understanding of the universe, from computer vision and the development of artificial intelligence to technology and visions of the future, from the evolution of eyes and the many and varied ways that organisms see, including even scallops, to the subjectivity of our interpretation of color. So how do we see? How is our perception of position and distance so accurate? The compound eyes of a fly always manage to warn that the fly swat is descending. The dog catches the tennis ball perfectly. The rugby player gathers the unexpected pass that's high and wet and in the wrong place. And even more astonishingly, the cricketer in the slips has just milliseconds to catch a spinning, rocketing ball. Well, of course, that's perfect. Goalies don't always stop the ball. But understanding of that third dimension is astonishingly good, whether it's flies, dogs, or, or humans, we know where we are relative to other objects. How does it happen? How does our stereo vision work? Even, how is it that we can see depth in the mystery of a two-dimensional Turner landscape, or in this painting? So our lecturer this evening is clearly going to address just that. Uh, Sir Colin Blakemore is the Professor of Neuroscience and Philosophy in the University of London's uh, Ad School of Advanced Study. He was formerly Chief Executive of the Medical Research Council and President of the British Science Foundation uh, Association. He's worked on many aspects of vision and neuroscience. He's written books for general readership, including Mechanics of the Mind and the Mind Machine, and his awards for the Public Communication of Science include the Royal Society's Michael Faraday Medal. So this evening, please welcome Colin Blakemore to speak on perception of visual space. Thank you very much, Mary. Well, this is the last talk in the series on, on vision. And those of you who have come to the preceding lectures will have heard a lot, I'm sure, about the processes in the, in the brain, in the eye and the brain, that enable us and other animals to recognize objects, to know what things are, to know about people, recognize faces, and so on. That's obviously very important if you want to find your way around in the world and respond appropriately to things. Objects are crucial. <coughs> 
for this, in this last lecture, I'm going to talk about the recognition of the bits between the objects, the space in which objects sit, um, which is equally important, as Mary said, knowing how far away an object is, is crucial, whether you, you're a predator or whether you're the potential prey of that um, object. We, we need to know about the distances of the things um, around us. Um, and I'm going to talk about the mechanisms in the brain for achieving that. Um, and this s story, uh, as with so much of the description of vision and, on, and, the, and research, the history of the science of vision, is intermingled with the history of, of art and of architecture. Because both artists and architectures are also crucially concerned with, with space, how to use it, how to form it, how to copy it and represent it. So as, as Mary said, um, actually talking about artists is a good starting point because um, uh, artists, at least in the history of Western art since the, the Renaissance, have made a valiant job of convincing the viewer of a picture in a, in a gallery that they're looking at something that it is not. A picture in a gallery is a flat object. It's a piece of canvas with some oil on it or whatever, an etching or an engraving or a drawing, whatever. And yet, simultaneously, you can entertain uh, the view that that is indeed what you're looking at, you're in a gallery, you know perfectly well this thing in a flame, uh, frame is flat, and yet you are convinced in parallel that it represents to you, in a you know, more or less convincing way, another world. Uh, looking through a window into a three-dimensional world, um, uh, as you can see in this, in this example. So I'm going to talk um, uh, about, it, uh, about how that uh, is, is achieved. Uh, the, a reasonable starting point to pose the problems um, for a scientist or an artist is, 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 with, is with Descartes. Descartes was not the first person to observe directly the form of the image in the eye. Uh, Scheiner had done that 30 years or so before, but this is from uh, La, La Dioptrique in 1637, where um, Descartes not only repeated the experiment, but also speculated on what it might mean. He obtained a, a fresh um, eye, uh, an ox eye from the local abattoir, fresh meaning still transparent and clear, cut a window in the back of the eye, taking away the white at the back of the eye, but leaving the jelly in, inside intact, put a piece of paper against the jelly, and then held the ox eye up to his room and found, I think even though he'd, he knew about China's experiments, must still have been astounded to see a tiny inverted perfect image of his room where everywhere he pointed the eye. Now to a uh, to a philosopher interested in, in epistemology, in how we gain knowledge of the world, but this must have been a, a re really remarkable experience to see a bit of, a, of an animal, in fact, a, a piece of a dead animal, capturing a perfect representation, if you like, of the outside world. Even though, at that stage, of course, the representation is just light, it's just a distribution of light, doesn't mean anything in terms of the understanding of the animal, as Descartes uh, clearly saw. But to see the image raised for him an important question, which is really the guiding question through this talk. And that is the fact that the image is, is essentially two-dimensional. It has depth in focus, of course, but at any moment, the image in the, in the eye is just a projection, an optical projection onto the plane of, of the retina of the world outside, which is almost always three-dimensional. And the three-dimensionality is lost in this projection. Um, it might look three-dimensional uh, uh, if you look at a painting or even look at a retinal image. Um, but the fact that you see it in three, three dimensions is something of a miracle, because it means that you must be interpreting the image itself to derive that sense of the third dimension. Um, and the retinal image is, it's not just that the information is directly given, um, because all of the information in the retinal image is is, in principle, completely ambiguous. If you were to see against a blank field uh, a round circle, and that is what you see out there in the world, it could indeed represent a circle, a hoop, or something like that, facing you directly, orthogonal to your line of sight. Um, but it, it, um, it, it might represent some other object, uh, some oval object, turned to such an angle that the projection of that oval object made a perfect circle on your retina. 
Uh, you have the task of distinguishing, of, of uh, deriving, of guessing, of projecting, of making some kind of hypothesis about what's out there in the world and what its shape and its distance is on the basis of this two-dimensional um, image. Um, a, a transcendent step in evolutionary terms in this process of trying to understand the third dimension is the development of binocular vision. Most animals in the world of, of, of all uh, classes and groups have eyes pretty much at the sides of their heads, which is an immense advantage. If you were a rabbit, if you can imagine for a moment being a rabbit, um, you would have an entire 360 degree view of this room, including what's behind your, your head. There'd be very little overlap in the fields of vision of the two eyes at the front and also at the back but you'd be able to see everything in, in between. Very useful, you'd think, if your primary concern is avoiding um, predators. Well, um, amongst all um, classes of, uh, of species, some animals have evolved to bring their eyes forwards, pointing forwards, hence sacrificing the huge advantage of panoramic vision. For what? For having the fields overlapping each other, sharing a view of the world between the two eyes so they, they see the same thing. There might be very minor advantages in that in terms of um, the ease of detection of very weak stimuli, you know, discrimination of fine detail perhaps, but it's quite clear that the major advantage is the ability to use the differences, the tiny differences between the two retinal images to compute information, directly compute information about the distances of objects, what we call stereoscopic vision. That was most directly uh, revealed by the work of uh, Wheatstone in the 1830s. In 1838, he um, announced the invention of the stereoscope, a device um, which allowed him to project different images to the two eyes. So he could essentially uh, show to the two eyes any combinations of uh, images, including pictures that represented the views that the eyes would actually gain when looking at a three-dimensional object. So here, for instance, in this illustration from his paper, if you see at the top, there are the two prisms at the front through which the eyes were looking, or two mirrors through which the eyes were looking and separated, looking at the two screens on the side. Look what's on the screen. Two, two, um, two drawings of rectangles with diagonals in between. They represent the views gained by the left eye on the left, the right eye on the right, um, looking down on top of a truncated um, pyramid. As if you're looking down a pyramid from above, because your left eye is further to the left, you see more of the left face. Your right eye is further to the right, you see more of the right face. And the brain can use that information, these minute differences in the retinal image, to give a compelling and immediate impression of depth. At least if you're amongst the 96, 7% of people who have stereoscopic vision. This is stereo. It's what you put your glasses on colored glasses on for in a 3D movie. It, it's what gives you this um, amazing, compelling impression of things jutting out and sticking out from surfaces. So, um, we are able to understand um, the, these minute differences in the positions of the images of parts of individual objects simply um, resulting from the slightly different viewing points of the two eyes. So here, pursuing the argument of the truncated pyramid. Here's the left eye view on the left, the right eye view on the, uh, on the right. If you were able to fuse those two images in a stereoscope, you would immediately see the top surface sticking out towards you. Well, how's that done? Well, um, interestingly, it was Newton who first recognized an essential step in that process was to bring information from the two eyes together within the, the brain. Previously, um, anatomists... I, I, comp very competent anatomists, even working with Newton, actually, in Cambridge, had suggested that the two eyes, as they project into the brain, are kept completely separate. Yes, indeed, they come very close to each other, and they touch each other in this structure called the optic chiasma, just here in the, behind the top of the nose. Um, but the suggestion was that the fibers from the eyes simply project into the same side of the brain. Well, in that case, they're not, they're not talking to each other, they're not communicating directly. It was Newton who actually, in the optics, wrote, this illustration is not from optics, he wrote very clearly um, a single paragraph towards the end of the optics, beautiful description of what actually happens. Heaven knows where he got the information from, just an idea perhaps, but it was a very clever idea. And his idea was, then it shows, 
in, in this uh, uh, sketch from his diaries, discovered after his death, um, that he was suggesting that fibers from one half of one eye project inwards to the same side of the brain, but the fibers from the nasal, the no nose side of the eye, go to the opposite side of the brain. And that process repeated on the other side, so the fibers from the outer half of the eye cross uh, don't cross over, they go to the same side, and those from the nasal side cross over. That means that th this structure, the optic tract, contains fibers from both eyes and contains fibers coming from corresponding half retinas. The, te the nasal retina of the opposite eye, the temporal retina of the eye on the same side. And because the retinal image is inverted, that, that part of each of the retinas looks out towards the opposite side of space. So this half of the brain, the, it's the right half of the brain, is receiving information through both eyes about the opposite half of the visual field. It seems curious, but it fits with a general pattern of organization of the vertebrate brain, uh, that uh, it's, it's a crossed structure, that each half of the brain seems to be concerned with the opposite half of the world, whether it's coming through the skin or through the ears or now through the, through the eyes. So Newton said that this was necessary in order for the brain to be able to understand information from and compare information from the two um, eyes. Uh, this shows a little more precisely and accurately how it is done. Newton actually thought that the nerve fibers from the right and left eye combine as soon as they meet in the optic tract. They fuse. That's not true. They stay separate, as shown in this wonderful illustration by the great anatomist Cajal. The fi fibers, again, he draws it correctly here, fibers crossing over, joining fibers that don't cross over, and they stay separate here. Um, in, in this structure, the nerve cells receiving the incoming fibers, that's a uh, so-called lateral geniculate nucleus, part of the thalamus, a great cl cluster of nerve cells that sends information up to the cerebral cortex. And it's here, Cajal suggested, without physiological evidence, that the information from, the, from corresponding nerve fibers, left eye and right eye nerve fibers in the thalamus, combines onto single points in the cortex. And he was, he was virtually exactly right. So the, the prediction would be that if you, could, uh, if you could record activity from nerve cells in this region, the so-called primary visual cortex, the back of the, the head, a big area of cerebral cortex, if you could record from uh, nerve cells in that area, you would expect them to respond to visual stimulation in either the left or the right eye. And moreover, if it's precisely organized, it should be in the same position in space whether it's coming through the left eye or the right eye. So the, the individual nerve cells could fuse information, could combine information about single objects in space. Um, well, that's, that's, that's true. And, and I was fortunate enough a long time ago to be involved in some of the early work on this topic. Uh, in the early 1960s, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, um, then at Johns Hopkins, moving a little later to Harvard, um, did work that won the Nobel Prize for them 20 years later, um, and they were, they were the, the first, at least correctly, to describe the properties of nerve cells in that part of the brain, recording from anesthetized cats, surprisingly large parts of the cerebral cortex, particularly the sensory areas of the cortex, still respond um, in anesthetized um, animals. The information is being received and processed. So they were able to record activity from these nerve cells in cats that were anesthetized while they moved patterns around on the screen in front of the animal's eyes. And what they found was two things, principally. Um, first, by comparison with the properties of the incoming fibers, which just respond to spots of light or spots of darkness, the neurons that they terminate on respond very selectively to lines or edges at particular orientations. So there's a transformation of information. And the very first neurons start the process of describing the forms of things in the retinal image in, in terms of the angles of the boundaries and edges uh, in, in the retinal image. The second really important thing, at least from, from, from my point of view, reading this, this work when I was a medical student in, in Cambridge, is that, the, that individual nerve cells in this area often respond to stimulation of either eye. Close one eye and the cell responds, let's say, to a vertical line. Close that eye and you find that the cell responds to the same vertical line, roughly the same part of the visual field through the other eye. 
So when both eyes are open, and this is what Hubel and Wiesel said, these neurons must be responding simultaneously through both eyes and therefore fusing the world, making a single world. Well, the problem, of course, is because the eyes are separated, because the views gained by the two eyes are very slightly different, as Wheatstone said, that can't happen for every nerve cell all the time because the images aren't in the corresponding positions all of the time. It depends on, on the third dimension. So when I went to, um, to Berkeley to work with um, Horace Barlow, um, great-great-grandson of Darwin, I mean, this context worth, well worth saying, uh, now at, at Cambridge, when I went to work with Horace Barlow, who was then at um, Berkeley to do a PhD, um, I was very interested in this characteristic that had been described. I wanted to work on binocular processing. And we, we started by looking at, asking the question, could these individual neurons be encoding and representing the third dimension of space? Um, and the, uh, this is the trio of us that published the first paper on, on this. Jack Pettigrew, Australian medical student at the time. Here is Horace. Um, what we did was to um, indeed confirm what Hubel and Wiesel had said. Uh, we're looking now at responses here. These are action potentials, impulses from an individual, one nerve cell in the cat cortex. Um, and you can see that through the left eye, with the right eye covered up, this cell responded to an oblique line moving across a blank screen when it crossed a particular position of the screen for the receptive field. But the response was very weak, in this case, just a couple of impulses. The same cell, if the, right, if the left eye was covered and the right eye was opened, now responded to exactly the same stimulus, pretty much exactly the same stimulus, in a roughly corresponding part of the field with a strong response. And when they're put together, the response is, is enhanced and facilitated as long as the alignment of the images is precise. So this must mean that if the animal's looking at a scene in which there are objects at different distances, only some nerve cells can, can, be, ha can have their receptive fields in the right position to respond to a boundary or a contour at a particular distance. So we thought if different nerve cells have slightly different po differently positioned receptive fields, different cells would respond to objects at different distances automatically, simply by virtue of where their receptive fields were on the retina. And the distances, the scatter, is, is minute. It's... it's, it's uh, a few thousandths of a millimeter variation in relative position. So something you could easily imagine just, just happening by chance in the wiring between the retina and the brain. So we did, we did that. We took great precautions to ensure that the eyes of the animal didn't move. The anesthetized, we worked on cats. Um, the anesthetized cat didn't move because, of course, that would contaminate the results and then calculated what the distances of objects would have to be in order to produce the optimal response from each cell we recorded. And here's a result from a typical um, animal. This is a sample of neurons. These are, each number describes the number of the cell in the sequence as we were recording in, in the brain. And you can see a, a sample of neurons here from, a, from one particular cat, lucky cat 13 for us, um, and the, the properties of these neurons are reconstructed as if the cat was fixating, was, had its eyes converged to fixate at 50 centimeters away. And each of these points then represents where a particular stimulus would have to be placed in space to generate the optimum response from each of these neurons. Each neuron responds best to a particular position, and there's a whole scatter of them covering a range of visual space, just what you need to decode the information uh, about the third dimension. There's a, a little problem here, actually, several problems. One is, um, it's the signals from any one cell aren't telling you anything precise. Signals from, if two different cells are firing, let's say some cell nine and cell four fire off simultaneously, the brain knows that there are two objects which are not in the same plane. They're at different distances from the eyes. But the separation of them, which is surely the crucial thing, will vary with the viewing distance of the animal for the same neurons. And that is because the essential cue is simply relative position on the retina. And it's shown in this diagram here. Um, if you think about um, looking at two objects separated by a particular distance, always the same distance, but the nearer object um, is at different distances from you. The um, so what, what you would like to find in the brain is a mechanism for encoding that. 
the relative distance, linear distance between two objects. So you could say from the signal in your brain, yes, that's two objects separated by, let's say, 10 centimeters, whatever the viewing distance. But the problem is that the disparity, the angular disparity generated between these two points varies hugely with viewing distance. It's a very non-linear function accelerating very rapidly as you look further away. So this, this um, separation here, which is the same as separation here, has a tiny angular difference in the, in the left eye, um, in, in the right eye, compared with this one, the same, the same linear distance, but a huge angular separation. So if the neurons in the brain are just looking at posi relative position on the retina, they will not be capable of signaling this, the, re the relative dist linear distance in, in space. And indeed, there's a lot of evidence in the literature that we are not very good at recognizing rel relative distance in space that uh, it, actually to summarize a whole lot of experimental work, the brain seems to default to an assumption that everything is basically 80 centimeters away. <laughs> Which is interesting because 80 centimeters is sort of extended arm's length. It's not a bad default if you haven't got any way of compensating for um, viewing distance compensating the disparity information that's coming in directly to these cells in your cortex with knowledge about how far away you're viewing, which, would, which could, in principle, allow you to correct it. There's quite a big literature saying that at least for individual points and objects, we are very bad at recognizing the linear separation, and we just assume that everything is about 80 centimeters away um, and, and compute the separation on that basis, where, how, whatever the actual viewing distance is. Well, this would be unfortunate, um, but it occurred to me that, you know, we don't live in a world of points. Visual psychologists and even physiologists are fascinated with how the brain responds to blank fields of light of different color and individual points. The world is not like that. We live in a world of surfaces, the surfaces of objects and shapes. So I thought maybe the brain does better at, represent, at representing and encoding the angles and depths of surfaces than it does with points. Nice picture by Hockney here illustrating the, the, uh, the powerful cue provided by surfaces. So um, we did, an ex and when I say we here, um, what I mean is the postdoc who did you know, most of the work did, you know, it's the kind of royal uh, we. Um, um, uh, this, is, this is work that I did with uh, postdoc uh, Yuan Yuan Zhao. Um, we asked people to look at a screen with two lines on it. This is a projection screen, or a TV screen, if you like, tilted at a particular angle. This is what's on the screen, simply a couple of lines, viewed through an aperture, so you didn't know what the true angle of the screen was. No information about the angle, except the, the um, depth and separation of the, the lines. Um, and we asked, we, you know, um, uh, neuroscience these days is extremely sophisticated with massively expensive equipment. <laughs> this is our version um, of it. Um, yes, the subject looked at a protractor and rotated the protractor to match what they thought was the angle of this surface they were looking at. So they just saw two lines through an aperture using binocular vision, stereoscopic vision. They, they saw an apparent surface between the two lines. And they have to say, if I was looking on, down on top of that, what would the angle be? And they set this. Now, it sounds crazy judgment. It is remarkably easy uh, to do, and the data are very um, compelling. So the question is, uh, if you do this at different distances, can the brain compensate for viewing distance and tell you accurately what the angle of the surface is? And what led me to think about that was that, you know, if you look at, let's say, a piece of paper, a book or something like that, uh, and move it backwards and forwards to different distances, it doesn't seem to change its angle as it should following the function that relates disparity to relative distance. It seems to be a book, until you get out to perhaps several meters when it gets really hard to tell that there's any depth at all. Okay, so we were able to look at the effects of distance, and here's a typical example. Um, these are for uh, three different viewing distances, 39 centimeters, 78, 156. And this is the angle of the actual stereo surface on the, um, on the computer screen. And this was the matching angle set on the protractor. And you do pretty well, whatever the viewing distance. No um, defaulting to 80 centimeters. And this uh, shows, uh, again, another example of the results. This is showing the perceived angle 
the, that is the protractor setting, if you like, for a real 45 degree angle of the screen uh, for several different viewing distances. This is the function that you'd expect if it's just following um, uh, pure disparity on the retina and it's defaulting to 80 centimeters. This, these are the actual data doing pretty well out to about six meters, then collapsing at very, very long viewing distances. So it looks as like the brain does have a mechanism for compensating for viewing distance. So it's accurately interpreting the angles of surfaces, correcting the disparity information by knowledge about viewing distance. Well, that's a good start. And in fact, um, it was an essential start for other experiments, which I'm going to describe in a moment. So animals with binocular vision have the luxury of stereoscopic vision. It must have been a really important evolutionary advantage because it's been selected for despite the loss of panoramic um, vision. It occurred quite um, uh, late in each, um, um, uh, in each group, at least in, in mammals particularly. Um, and there's very good evidence that it evolved the interpretive mechanisms in the brain for understanding stereoscopic vision evolved separately from me mechanisms that might be based on single retinal images, just looking at the retinal image to find out, uh, to compute what the world might be like. Um, now, if you look at the organization of the, the cerebral hemispheres of a primate, this is in fact a, a monkey, an old world monkey, the human brain doesn't look that different and it's organized very similarly. This is the back of the brain here, this area called V1, shown diagrammatically here, is the primary visual cortex. That's the area that Barlow and Pettigrew and I had um, looked at and discovered that neurons can respond to particular disparities in space. There's then a great tangle of other areas, a network, perhaps 30, 40 of them in you, stretching forwards, occupying maybe a third of your entire cerebral cortex, um, all pretty much devoted to recomputing the visual image. All the information comes into here, into V1, there it is, but then it gets shunted off to these different regions who do their own computing job. You know, some of them more concerned with vision, others more concerned with faces or object form and so on, more, others more concerned with movement, certainly. And interestingly, the further analysis of stereoscopic distance seems to have occurred in what's called the dorsal stream, the stream that's mainly concerned with recognizing movement and providing information to the motor system for the control of movement. Quite separate from the so-called ventral stream going down here into the temporal lobe, which is certainly more concerned with recognizing objects, faces, houses, forms, and things. Interesting, because of course, you know, recognizing faces and objects itself depends on stereoscopic vision to some extent, the way that you're able to see the full form of an object. Try looking at an object and closing one eye looks really rather different. But um, it, it means then that, uh, that stereo is being handled by a separate part of the visual pathway. That's shown in this picture here. This is an imaginary flattened view of the human cerebral cortex with different regions corresponding to monkey areas here. And you can see hotspots, these two yellow hotspots, are generated in the people in the scanner, in the MRI scanner, when a random dot surface suddenly generated a stereo um, increment, a bit that bobbed out towards the viewer in the, looking at it on the screen in the scanner. So the appearance of a pure stereo three-dimensional pattern elicited um, activity principally in this area here and, and also in the subregion here. These are parts V3 and, and MT are parts of the dorsal stream here, V3, V3A and MT here, heading up towards the parietal cortex. Distinct regions which seem to be devoted to the analysis of stereo vision. That's fine for binocular animals, but you know, rabbits, uh, mice, and, and so on, do pretty well at, uh, it flies, at, um, uh, at dealing with the third dimension, even though they don't have stereo vision. And people who, the 3% the or so of people without normal stereo vision also do pretty well, including some well-known sports um, uh, athletes, by the way. Um, and if you close one eye, I mean, uh, just try it. Just look at this room with both eyes open, and if you have stereo vision, yes, it has this sort of graphic quality of depth. If you close one eye, it isn't as if the whole thing just collapses and you don't know whether these people here are closer than those people there. You still have a sense of depth, but it's, it's almost as if the colors, the, the, the stereo color, if you like, has gone out of it. Some additional quality to the depth is, is lost. 
uh, um, uh, if you lose stereo vision. But you can still see relative distances. And in some circumstances, it's an essential um, skill. I mean, here's an example. This happens to be a, a photograph of the um, British ambassador's residence in uh, Chile. Um, uh, just you know, showing off my uh, adventures in the last year or so. But no, I thought it was a really nice example of the power of monocular cues. You are looking now, there's no stereo in this, you're looking at a picture, a photograph on the screen, and yet it's full of depth information. There's just absolutely no doubt that this thing, you know, is further away than this thing. And it's provided, of course, by all kinds of computable information in the image itself, particularly by perspective. By the fact that the lines here converge towards a particular point, parallel surfaces have share a single vanishing point, all the rules, the classic rules of perspective, your brain is apparently able to use them or use something approximating to them, as you'll see in a second. There other, there's other information as well. The texture in the carpet gets smaller. Um, the size, this chair is smaller than this chair, so if you know that chairs are always roughly of the same size, then you can compute from that. There's lots of rich computational information in a single image that could tell you about relative distance. And there's been almost... No research previously on this aspect of depth perception, even though it is by far the most important one to, to animals that don't have stereoscopic vision. And presumably, in us, it has to be integrated somehow with the stereo information. So that's an interesting computational challenge. Artists as well, of course, have been intrigued with the same issues because they have the inverse problem, the problem of wanting to create the impression of distance on a flat surface. So, in a way, the painting is like a retinal image. If the painting, the flat painting, can provide you, with you in your eye with a retinal image which is identical to the image that would be created by looking at a three-dimensional scene, then the painter's hope is that you will see that scene with its three-dimensionality. Well, you know the, the story, of course. Uh, perspective was supposed to have been discovered in, at the beginning of the 15th century in Florence, Brunelleschi in particular. In fact, it was a longer and more gradual process than that with some empirical steps towards understanding the rules of perspective um, a bit long before Brunelleschi. Here, though, in the 13th century, this is, a, this is an absolutely characteristic example of the efforts to try to represent the third dimension without an understanding of perspective. Um, so even the relative sizes of things are wrong, Distant ones aren't consistently smaller than the near ones. There's no perspective um, information. It's just a best guess to try to interpret this image, principally in terms of overlap. This head is definitely closer than the couch or whatever it is because it's overlapping it. So there are cues, but not very um, accurate or convincing. Um, Giotto, so, you know, so, so far ahead of his time in so many respects, but uh, Giotto was getting close even at the beginning of the 14th century. Um, if, if this, in, this, um, in this example, Christ before um, Caiaphas, if you perform a perspective analysis showing the lines of convergence here, you see that he's got the roof pretty right, the vaulted roof, um, with a, an almost convergent single vanishing point. Things go a bit wrong here. These should be converging too, but they're not. So it's a, it's a mixture of half-accurate attempts, just by eye, I presume, at perspective, without, clearly without understanding the geometry. And it was supposed to have been Brunelleschi, the uh, architect of the Duomo in, in, in Florence and of the baptistry, um, and, um, and a painter of some repute, who was supposed to have solved the problem in the sense of deriving some kind of formulaic approach. That formulaic approach isn't recorded. There's no record of any mathematics or any geometric construction. All that we know is that it, probably in about 1413, I think the estimate is, he presented a demonstration um, of the fact that he could produce paintings which were a perfect replica of the projections of solid objects. And the solid object in particular that he was concerned with was his baptistry that he built. So here's, um, here's a sketch of the baptistry um, as viewed from the entrance, the porch of the Duomo, um, which is the point at which um, Brunelleschi painted a picture of the baptistry. So he stood in the, in the porch of the Duomo, painted on a wooden panel, a painting of the, of the baptistry, and then used that painting to demonstrate that he got it right geometrically. And the way that he's supposed to have done it, which can't actually be true, but, but this is what he's supposed to have done, you can see the principle, is he um, 
demonstrated that if you now stood where the painting had been painted, turned the painting around so the picture was pointing towards the baptistry, and peeked through a hole drilled in the panel so you could see the baptistry through the painting of the baptistry, but then held a mirror up in front of you to look at the painting, all right, then everything matched. You could move the mirror around and look at the painting, and it would precisely uh, um, align with the boundaries of the baptistry. There are two problems with that. One is it depends on the distance of the mirror, really very critically. You could, you could make it match whatever its, its appearance, just by moving the mirror a little bit. Secondly, the image is mirror reversed. Well, it doesn't matter with a baptistry because it's symmetrical. <laughs> but it wouldn't work with anything else. It wasn't a terribly good experiment. The people got terribly excited, and he was admired, even at the time, with the discoverer of a remarkable method that artists could use to represent uh, three-dimensional form. And there must have been rules, because his, um, in the 1420s, his Masaccio, also in, in Florence, um, painting in the Brancacci Chapel, um, and clearly understanding the rules of perspective. So here's a perspective reconstruction of this building here on the right. And not only is it correct, the vanishing point, uh, the, uh, there's a single vanishing point, all the lines converge, but it is in the head of Christ. And artists were already discovering that they could use the power of the imagery of perspective to emphasize features of scenes. And this became a, a, a favorite motif in, in Renaissance painting, to make the vanishing points of apparently irrelevant features of a scene like buildings draw the eye, as they imagined, um, towards a crucial feature of the, of the scene. This is 14, 1425 or thereabouts. The form, the formulation of the rules and the publication of the rules is attributed to this man, Alberti, um, who published two books um, in Italian and in Latin, just a year apart, 1435, in which he described very precisely the geometry of projection. It's simply, it's simply a, a matter of optics and geometry. If, if um, patterns in a three-dimensional scene are imagined passing through a flat surface and you could record where each ray of light hit that flat surface, that would be a perfect picture of that scene. And if you were to view it, then it should reproduce in your eye exactly the same image that you have if you look at a real three-dimensional scene. That's the, the notion. So he, he described all of the rules, including things like how the spacing between equally spaced objects, like tiles on a floor, and so on. And this propagated incredibly quickly through the painting, painting um, uh, community. Um, well, one of the questions that um, has not been addressed, or had not been addressed, is how the brain, under the brain understands perspective. Clearly, we can see form from perspective alone, but how do we do it? Um, Imagine that you look at a computer screen like, like this with some lines drawn on it, these thin black lines, nothing else. Gray, light gray screen with thin black lines. You look at it through an aperture, a round aperture, so you know nothing about the, the true form of the surface. You immediately see an apparently angled surface generated by the geometry of the lines, if, if indeed the geometry matches what it should be for a particular angled surface. So you can compute what these lines would be if they were on, if you imagine lines on a real um, surface which is rotated away from you, the angles between the lines um, define the rotation of that surface with respect to you. Well, how good are people at knowing the angle of that imaginary surface purely from a very simple pattern of lines? That's a question that we asked. The experiment we did was this, um, and the only um, interesting feature of it is uh, that we devised a way of measuring very simply, quantitatively, the perceptual impressions created by monocular um, images, including just sets of lines on the screen. What we did was to show um, the, this is a large computer screen here. And one part of it here, it's viewed through a stereoscope. So one part of it here is viewed by the left eye. And on it is a pattern of lines creating an apparently rotated surface. Pure perspective information viewed monocularly, no disparity, no stereo. But superimposed on top of it, pop, top of it are three little dots. There are three little dots on the other half of the screen, which is viewed by the right eye. And these dots are organized so that they form a, a stereo array. They're seen binocularly. 
and you can adjust the spacing of the dots in the eyes so that the two outer dots can be rotated around to different positions. In other words, forming a, a stereo surface. So you've got um, in, the, in the person's head two sources of information about the surface they're looking at. The information from the perspective lines, seen only by the left eye, and superimposed on top of it, the information from the stereo dots, which can be rotated around in space until they match. So you can use the stereo setting to measure the apparent perception of this perspective surface. And it turns out to be very easy to do, reproducible. You turn the angle of the surface in any way you want to, and the subject and the person can very easily just set these dots to, to match it. It depends, the principle depends on stereo sensations being accurate, but we know that they are from the preceding experiment, from the stereo constancy experiment. So we can use stereo as a veridical readout for the way in which people are perceiving information from sets of lines. And here's a typical example. This is the um, angle of the surface represented by the perspective lines ranging from 70 degrees tilted in one direction to 70 degrees tilted in the other direction. And here, the angle of the stereo surface, the three dots, that matched it. What you'd expect, if everything's perfect, if your perception from perspective is perfect, you'd expect the stereo and the um, perspective depth impressions to line up precisely along the dotted line. They don't, but they do follow a nice function. It's always less than the expected value. The stereo settings were always less tilted than the geometry of the perspective surface um, would predict. This means we underperceive, we underperceive the tilt, the three-dimensional rotation of surfaces when the only information that we have available about them is perspective. This, it's true in this room, I'll convince you in a second, it's true anywhere, buildings, rooms, whatever. We underperceive. The, the, the tilt of, of uh, the slope of surfaces. The degree of the, you can express the um, error as a gain, the, um, the magnitude of the tilt, an angular gain, the magnitude of the tilt of the stereo surface needed to match a perspective surface, a computed perspective surface. And the gain varies from person to person, um, and it varies in interesting ways. These are I don't know, half a dozen or more different observers. This is the gain, and you can see it doesn't reach one for anybody. Always the gain is less than one. They're always under-perceiving the perspective surface. And this here is the number of lines on the screen providing the perspective information. Now, we thought that surely, you know, the more confirming evidence you put in, like an artist would, the more lines you put on the surface of a building, surely the more powerful the perception of the tilt and the depth would be, and it's not. Um, two lines is quite enough. Two lines, two little thin black lines on the screen, which are not parallel to each other, immediately generate the full impression of depth you're ever going to get from perspective. It's not, the impression you get is not the true impression, but it's certainly not improved by adding more. Now, I think this tells you something about what's happening in the brain. I think it must mean that the brain, the mechanism, wherever it is and whatever it is, depends on the brain doing a computation based on neighboring lines and only neighboring lines, not taking into account others, and just saying, hey, there are two lines there that are not the same orientation. I'm going to assume that those two lines belong to contours which are really parallel to each other in the real world. Like, you know, the, the top and the bottom of this piece of paper. Um, if I make that assumption, and I can see that there's a difference in angle between them, if I know how far away it is that I'm viewing, and I know the angular separation of the lines, I can then compute what the surface is. That's just geometry. Well, the brain sort of does that. It gets it wrong. It undercalculates, but that's the, that must be the computation that's, that's going on, I think. And it doesn't depend on additional um, lines. It doesn't help. Now, what about what artists do? Um, and what about the real world, like this room, where we have much more than just bare lines telling us about form. We have people of different sizes, and we have texture on the floor and all the other things. How do they integrate? Do they actually enhance and add to the impression of depth? Are we computing perhaps in a kind of Bayesian way, using the best 
possible individual features to nudge us out towards the most accurate interpretation. And we decided to look at that using identical techniques. So what we did was to um, ask whether artists might be able to improve the gain of monocular depth perception by throwing in more cues in their paintings, um, but taking into account that when paintings are actually viewed in a gallery, they're viewed with both eyes open normally, and they are actually flat. So stereo information in a gallery is always contradicting what the monocular information says. The painting says, you're looking at a scene, you're, it's a piazza and the building's here. Your stereo system you says, no, don't be fooled by that. This is just a flat painting. H how's that solved? Uh, is, is there a conflict? Okay. So what we did was to repeat our experiments, but using bits of paintings. We found parts of paintings with reasonably flat um, sloped surfaces. We could compute from the geometry what that surface represented in depth, what the angle of that rotation, the geometry actually represented, and we could ask people what they saw by giving a stereo comparison and just asking them to rotate the stereo lines until it matched and read out from the stereo what they were seeing. Did that with a number of um, well-known paintings, all, all kinds of examples of, of um, pictorial representation with very strong monocular features of, of slanting, sloping surfaces, um, uh, photographs, for instance, and so on. Um, some of the experiments were done monocularly, so only one eye saw the painting. But here's the stereo um, readout below. In, in this case, it's below the, the, uh, the image, and the person rotated in depth these three lines to make them match the apparent surface, the slope of the surface. And this is done monocularly. But we could also do it binocularly, as viewing a painting in a gallery. Show the two pictures, identical, no stereo information about depth, it's just flat. Um, but let's see whether the stereo matches that they give down here are not flat. If they're not flat, it means that the monocular information must be overriding the stereo impression created by the binocular view of a flat surface. And here are the... Um, t and we compared that with just our standard lab experiment with the same people in the same um, experimental run with just lines on the screen now, asking them again to match with stereo. And this is the very typical result. Um, this shows the, um, the slant, the virtuals of the slant, the rotation calculated from the geometry of the, monocu of the, um, uh, of the monocular cues, of the perspective cues the rotation of the surface in the painting the person was looking at. Um, this uh, shows the matching, the stereo match to it. And the uh, crosses here show the results for our simple lab demonstration with, with just lines on the screen. And it shows the typical nice variation. You match the stereo to the, the, the perspective, but you undermatch it. The, the gain is less than one. I've described that before. But now the dots, the colored dots, refer to paintings or photographs rather than lines. And they're viewed in two conditions, monocularly, the orange dots, where you have no conflicting binocular information telling you it's flat, and green when it's viewed binocularly. And what you can see is immediately, viewing it binocularly reduces the gain even further. It makes it look flatter, but not completely flat. So there must be some interaction, some quantitative interaction between disparity information and uh, perspective information, um, and neither one completely wins. But if you look at the, the orange dots, these are viewing monocularly, where you're not just viewing lines, neutral lines on the screen, you're viewing a rich painting or a photograph, and the gain increases. So yes, there must be some integrative process, which is combining monocular cues to enhance the perception of distance. Stereo can contradict um, that process, but not completely eliminate it. And uh, summarizing those results, um, here's the pure perspective image, just the screen with the lines on it. Here's the effect of monocular viewing of real paintings in, in increased gain, and here's the effect of viewing them flat and binocular, reducing the gain. Right. So uh, artists could enhance the perception of, of, of depth by um, not only by adding more information about distance, but also by deliberately breaking the rules. Any art student, and I would guess any art student from 1435 onwards, has learnt the basic rules of perspective. They all know how to construct a perfect, geometrically perfect construction with vanishing points and so on. 
breaking the rules would mean disobeying what you've learnt and recognizing that by, uh, by altering the geometry of the image you could produce an even more enhanced impression of depth. Um, and I, I have found a few examples of artists doing that, but to do it, you have to remember they have to overturn all, all this the amazingly simple way of constructing very compelling images which um, Brunelleschi's work and others had, had taught them. So, let me give you one example. This is um, Google Earth view of the Spanish steppes in Rome. Here we are, um, here are the steppes. Um, uh, Keats lived here for the last year of his life, and there's a Keats uh, museum there now. And Keats was a keen amateur painter and drawer, and he, artist, and he drew um, a rather nice, compelling picture of the Spanish steppes. Um, um, and the piazza above, from this point here, just in front of the, the fountain. Now, here's a photograph, 35 millimeter camera, co correct proportions, a photograph taken from that point, and you can see here it is. And I think you, you'll see what I mean. The, do the, can I ask you, do you think that these surfaces are actually parallel to each other? Do, does this look as if those two surfaces there are actually precisely parallel to each other? Now, to my eye, and my gain is about 0.5, they don't look parallel, they look tilted inward, which is just what I'd predict from my, my gain less than, than one. Well, interestingly, this is Keats, um, and there's a perspective construction, by the way, to show you that they are actually parallel to each other. This is a photograph of two roughly parallel surfaces, the single viewing point, but they don't look it. This is Keats' drawing. And I think you'll see that what he's done is to tilt the buildings outwards. This slope here is more extreme than this. This, is this appears to be converging inwards. That's sloping more outwards, and this one too. So if you do a perspective reconstruction on Keats, it's not correct. I think he's just done it by eye because it looks better. That looks more parallel than this does, even though this is real and that's synthesized. Okay. So has any artist deliberately used that to make his pictures look more real? I think this is, this is a nice example. And by the way, this is a wonderful Van Eyck. Uh, um, painted in Northern Europe one year after um, um, Alberti's book, already the information had spread everywhere. Everyone knew the rules. So if you look at the wonderful floor here, it's drawn in perfect perspective, Alberti perspective. And you can show from the reconstruction of the, um, the geometry of, of the perspective how precise it is with a vanishing point in the womb of the Virgin, and the immediately symbolic use of the vanishing point. But look at the vanishing point for the canopy above her head. That's in her, perhaps in her heart. It's not sharing the same position as the vanishing point of the floor, which it geometrically should do if the canopy is parallel to the floor, which presumably it's supposed to be. I think what Van Eyck has done is to shift, deliberately shift apart the vanishing points to make it look more right, to make it look more compelling, breaking the rules of perspective, which must even then have been hard for an artist to do because the rules of perspective are so amazing and so generatively amazing. Okay, um, I'm nearly finished. So now the final question is, if we don't perceive perspective quite correctly in paintings or on computer screens, do we see it correctly in the real world where everything is combined, all the information is combined accurately, the stereo, the relative sizes, the perspective, and everything. And if we don't see it correctly, does it interfere with, you know, with, the, with the aesthetics, if you like, of our experiences? Um, well, let me, and this is my starting point when I noticed um, this feature. This is perhaps the most famous piazza in Rome. It's the Campidoglio, the original northern entrance just north of the Forum um, to classical uh, Rome, uh, the Palatine Hill. Um, and it was, uh, and Michelangelo was given, given the task of creating it. There were two existing buildings. This existed, uh, the, um, the Palazzo here and the Library Biblioteca here already existed. This space was free, but he was constrained by the fact there was a church sitting here on the edge of the hill. So many have argued, you know, when looking at this view, it's very odd. Why, why are these lines converging so stupidly? You know, it's supposed to be a nice piazza. 
And people have always argued, well, it had to do with the fact there's another building here. He couldn't squeeze it in. He had to rotate it. But I think it's more than just that. And there are some wonderful features of the design of this that suggest very strongly that it was all deeply thought out. The fact, for instance, that this um, um, amazing pattern uh, in the courtyard of the piazza, which wasn't, by the way, completed to Michelangelo's design um, until the Second World War, Mussolini um, uh, um, commissioned the completion of the floor. But this shape here forms a perfect circle when viewed from the viewing point at the top of the palazzo, absolutely perfect. Well, what about this oddness here? Imagine you're coming up the steps, the so-called um, uh, coordonata, coming from the road below, coming up for the first time to see the magnificent view of the palazzo ahead of you. What do you see? You're standing here. You look upwards, and you see this. This is the view. And I would posit that these two buildings, these two surfaces, do not look as if they're converging towards you. I mean, to my eye, they look pretty nicely straight and parallel. If, on the other hand, if you're coming out, leaving, the view that you have is this. Obviously, you see the strong angular convergence because the buildings really are converging in that direction and it's adding to your perceptual misinterpretation. But going in, everything looks aesthetically much more satisfactory. And it turns out the angle of this, which is about 18 degrees, um, exactly compensates for the average perceptual under, under perception of, per, from perspective. You might say that was just chance. Um, but look at this. This um, is um, the uh, Vatican, the, um, the Piazza San Pietro in front of the, the Vatican. Michelangelo had worked on the dome of the, the, the Vatican. He died. He died actually 20 years before the completion of the Campidoglio. And Bernini took over the restoration of the interior of St. Peter's and the design, this amazing design of uh, St. Peter's Square, which I'm sure you, many of you have been to. Very dramatic, innovative, oval design. Um, the plan was prepared in the year after the opening of the Campidoglio. The last building was completed, big celebrations, and Bernini then worked on the design of this. Well, look at the entrance, the colonnade entering, uh, the, uh, approaching St. Peter's. It's angled. And actually, it's even a slightly asymmetrical, like the Campidoglio. Um, and so therefore, when you're, if you're, you're here and you're looking towards St. Peter's, the view you have of this, and I think those look pretty parallel to me, if you're leaving, the Pope's view as you're leaving is like this. The, the angle is exaggerated. But what matters is when you're approaching, really. You know, when you're leaving, you've been there, done that. You're not so concerned about the aesthetics. All right. This is the Campidoglio, which was this building here, the, um, the Palazzo Nuovo, was co completed to Michelangelo's design one year before the design of this. Different, slightly different scale. This is bigger, but... virtually precisely aligns in proportions and in, in angles. Even the asymmetry, actually. This is less tilted than that. Um, there, were, there were previous examples of trapezoidal um, piazzas um, preceding uh, Michelangelo's. There was not an entire, entirely original um, development. And all, every trapezoidal piazza I've been able to find a record of has the same, as it were, distortion. It's always turned inwards towards the viewer as they look at the principal building. It can't just be chance. Uh, and that's the view of this uh, church in Pienza. Um, and we're still doing it. Um, I went to um, a meeting in the south of France last year and visited this amazing, if you have the chance to go, do, just north um, um, of uh, Marseille, um, there's a, a beautiful vineyard which has been meticulously developed by an Irish family that owns hotels in London. I can't remember their name, but anyway, it's, it's not just a wonderful vineyard. It's scattered with the most extraordinary works of art. They commissioned major architects and sculptors and so on, designers, to produce pieces of art which are scattered around the vineyard, including um, the uh, pavillon d'exposition de, uh, designed by uh, Renzo Piano, the designer of the Shard. 
and, and it's an exquisite building. It doubles up as, a, as an exhibition space and as a wine store. You don't see the wine store, it's underground on each side. But you enter, you go down this path down the low ground, normal ground level. And as you approach this ex exhibition space, you go through glass doors, four panes of glass. You look through into the space and you see four panes of glass at the other end going out onto a balcony. You look out across the vineyard, right? Now again, I don't know what your eyes will tell you, but my eyes tell me that this is a rectangular space. Those two um, walls are parallel to each other. Therefore, these four panels are the same width, absolute width, as those four. In fact, these panels are more than twice as big as these panels, twice as wide. And if you view the building from above, you see why. Here it is. You're at this point here looking in. There's the design. You're here looking in. It's, and notice, by the way, the asymmetry. Same asymmetry as in the Campidoglio. Here it is. So, Campidoglio. Uh, Renzo, Renzo Piano. Super... <laughs> I've been trying to get in touch with Piano. He was in London two or three months ago, and I couldn't reach him to see whether this is deliberate or, again, just, just chance. But I think this is a device, um, and it's an aesthetic trick. And whether the architects understand better than we do the perceptual base of the trick, I don't know, but it seems to be very um, real. Um, right. Uh, one, one minute more, because this just shows the power of art schools. You learn this wonderful, these wonderful rules of perspective. You apply them and you make beautiful pictures. But of course, if what you're drawing is not rectilineally regular, the rules are wrong. So here's a very nice example. This is Canaletto. This is Canaletto's painting of the Campidoglio. So we know the Campidoglio is not rectangular, right? We know that this building is not parallel to that building. They're sloping inwards, a total of about 18 degrees. But he has painted it as if they are. Um, and he, also, interestingly, the viewing point, and you can see why he did this and might have made the mistake, because the imaginary viewing point from which he's painting this picture is 16 meters above the road, below. He could not have been at this level painting this picture. He must have drawn sketches, gone back to the studio and reconstructed it, following the rules he'd learned at art school. But he, he reconstructed an, uh, an imaginary and false uh, piazza, not the real thing. All right, just to conclude. Um, there's something very interesting about perspective. It's compelling, it's wonderful, artists love it. But I think that it must be something we learn. Because the natural world is not full of parallel lines. There are no parallel lines in the natural world. And yet the whole, the algorithm for computing perspective is based on the assumption that when the brain sees two lines in the retinal image that are not the same angle, they are derived from contours that are actually parallel to each other. Therefore, the angle tells you about the rotation. So it only works in a world that has real parallel lines. In other words, a carpentered world, a, 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 in a world, I, I mustn't say man-made world, a person-made world. It's a world that we've put together um, based, of course, on the fact that, you know, because of what, what gravity does, it's much easier to make things that are parallel and straight and stand up with straight lines than it is curvy things. But we all have to learn it. I think the children, have, and there's some evidence for this, learn to use perspective very gradually from learning from their image. Well, that's fine, as long as our experience is accurate in telling us the rules. And the problem is that architects are detaching themselves so efficiently from the constraints of gravity. This Liebskin building in Singapore, um, this extraordinary building are on City Road, if you, if you know it, the M building, Everything's wrong. I mean, this, it's ridiculous. This point is very much higher in reality than that point, and it creates the impression of a building being much longer than it is. And look at where the windows are. They're all over the show. Look at this. These, these are two buildings side by side. Those surfaces are actually angled equally with respect to each other. So this is literally mind-blowing for the perspective processing. And not to mention um, this. This is Frank Gehry. I know. Um, and that's the interior of that, um, that building. Um, so I've tried to give you a taste of the way in which actually still very simple methodology can still provide information, interesting information about vision. Vision is such a rich resource of, of questions and, and, uh, and answers. And, and also to show, as I said at the beginning, the, the way in which the history of art and architecture are interwoven, really, with the history of the science of the perception of, 
of, of space. And finally, just to acknowledge my collaborators and sources of um, funding and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. very much indeed that was just fascinating now as regular <coughs> visitors to the uh, attendees at these lectures will know usually at this point I announce uh, highlight the following week's speaker but you know all good things come to an end and we've come to the end of this this year's series but I can highlight the fact that each week's lecture is uh, filmed and then streamed and you can access it uh, from the Darwin College website this one will be, should be available early next week uh, also, each series of eight lectures, uh, the lecturers write, uh, write that up, and it's edited in a book. So here I have, we had a book launch last week, uh, last evening. This is the, uh, uh, the book from the Extremes lecture series with, with Lise Doucette and De David Runciman and uh, Ros Savage and Nassim Nic Nicholas Taleb in. So on the table outside in the foyer, there are copies of the books from, the, uh, from Extremes Development and Games uh, lecture series, if you're interested in those. But what else do I have to do? I mean, we've had an ex a fascinating, a superb set of lectures uh, this year. And I'm sure that the series next year will be two. And I know that some of you have been puzzling as to what next year's series might be and trying to extract information from those of us who know, but there's no need to wait any longer because I can give you a preview, hopefully. These are previous titles of lecture series, none of these. What is it? <laughs> Starts on the 17th of January. Every Friday in the Lent term, you have the titles and the speakers. What's the theme? Enigmas. So we'll see some of you, many of you perhaps, 17th of January next year. Thank you very much. Finally, just thank, many thanks to Colin Blakemore again for coming.